Our Old Testament reading is found from Isaiah chapter 25. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well-refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. This is the word of the Lord. Our psalm is from Psalm 16. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones, in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their name on my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion in my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places, Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also, my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. This is the word of the Lord. Our epistle reading is found from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to the apostles, last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 16th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. My friends, this morning I would like to talk to you about three of the most dangerous words in a marriage. Three common words that we use all the time but nonetheless have the power to strike fear into the hearts of husbands across this world. Now, I'm going to say them now, and I want you to prepare yourselves, okay? Here they go. Did you 
remember. Gah! Every time I hear it, I still get chills. Because those, that question has ended so poorly for me so many times during the course of my marriage. Because the answer was, of course, no. I'm guessing you've had your own moments like these. Did you remember to pick up milk from the store while you were there? Did you remember to load the dishwasher and take out the trash? Did you remember to get the car inspected? Did you remember to fix the latch on the kitchen cabinet? Did you remember to pay the electric bill? Did you remember to make reservations for Valentine's Day? Did you remember our anniversary? Did you remember to pick up Billy from soccer practice? Although if she asked that one, chances are she already knows the answer <laughs> to that one. Now, some of you are a lot more conscientious and detail-oriented than I am, so maybe you don't have as many catastrophic did-you-remember moments as I do. But all of us, at some point, have had that panicked feeling of just forgetting. Just plain forgetting. Even if it's just forgetting why you walked into the kitchen and why you're standing in front of an open refrigerator, dazed and confused. In our text this morning, we might ask these three women the same question. Did you remember? At the beginning of our text, we see Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome heading up to Jesus' tomb with spices in tow to anoint him. There was nothing unusual about that plan. It was part of the normal burial rite. But that's precisely what makes this particular trip so problematic. You see, Jesus told the disciples at least three times exactly what was going to happen. That he was going to be betrayed, persecuted, and crucified, and that he would, on the third day, rise from the dead. But as we look at these women heading up to anoint him, it seems as though they've completely forgotten his words. They've got all their anointing stuff with them, and they're fretting about how they're going to roll the stone away. These are not the words of people who remembered what Jesus said to them. Follow along with me, starting at verse 4. And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. That reaction isn't just for these particular women, is it? Because the other disciples didn't remember Jesus' words either, did they? In fact, when the women go back and report to the other disciples what they've seen and that Jesus is alive, initially they don't believe it. In fact, the word in Luke is that they think it's nonsense. Why? Because they were overcome with grief. You know, as many times as I've heard sermons on these texts and preached sermons on these texts, and as many times as I've talked about how the disciples just don't get it, because we've got plenty of examples of that throughout Scripture, the one element that I hadn't really considered, and perhaps should have, was the emotional component to all of this. When the disciples didn't remember Jesus' words to them, despite the fact that he told them at least three times exactly what was going to happen to him, I don't think it was because they were poor students with bad memories. Instead, I think it's because they were sad. They lost their teacher, they lost their friend, they lost their Lord, and they were sad. And you know what? In the vast majority of their life experience, Dead people don't rise. The tomb was a one-way ticket. So when you combine that grief with their lived experience, those words of Jesus seem to fall away. As the text goes on, the angel told these women, Go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Yes, Jesus told the disciples this would happen. He said it on Thursday night when he predicted they would all fall away as he was arrested and killed. Do you remember? Also on Thursday, 
Jesus sent two of the disciples into Jerusalem, where they would see a man with a water jar. He would lead them to a house where there would be a room for the Passover. And what happened then? They went to the city and found it, just as he told them. Did you remember? Now, there are times in our lives that we forget things. I gave some examples at the beginning of my sermon this morning. But those are usually pretty small things. And perhaps they're things that we only heard once. But something this big, the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ, if there was ever anything that the disciples should have remembered, it was that. Even if they were nodding off during the lecture, this one should have stuck. So there must be something else going on here. Jesus keeps his word even as our emotions overcome us and we forget what we heard. That's why I think we have to put ourselves in their shoes for a moment and ask whether we've ever forgotten Jesus' words. Jesus made a lot of promises to us, hasn't he? He's promised us that our sins are forgiven by grace through faith in him. He's promised us that he's coming again in glory. He's promised us a new heaven and a new earth. He's promised us that he'll destroy death itself. And we've heard these words, haven't we? Many of you have been attending church most, if not all, of your lives. Many of you have been attending this congregation for decades. Let me ask you, have you always remembered Jesus' words? When we heard news about a deadly virus from the other side of the world that was quickly spreading in our country, did, did you remember Jesus' words? When you went to the supermarket and the shelves were bare, did you remember Jesus' words? And this goes way beyond the pandemic because we've all been in difficult situations. Maybe it's a scary diagnosis. Maybe it's a job loss. Maybe you're living paycheck to paycheck. Maybe it's trouble with your kids or you're struggling to care for your aging and infirm parents. Whatever the challenge is that you might have faced, the question is, did you remember Jesus' words? If you were overcome with anxiety and grief, Jesus' words may have seemed far away or irrelevant. But if you did remember Jesus' words, if you did remember the promises of Christ, then you were able to face these situations with courage and hope. If the three scariest words in a marriage are, did you remember, then the three most comforting words in a marriage are, Christ has risen. Because that good news, that victory, that resurrection changes everything in every aspect of our lives, including our marriages. The fact that Jesus rose from the dead is not just something we learn in Sunday school. It's a reality that impacts every conversation we have, everything we know, everything we believe, everything we hope for, everything we dream, and everything we are. This life, this broken life, with all its frustrations and disappointments, it's not all there is. Because Christ has risen. Christ is risen. This world is passing away, and a new one is on the way. There's a resurrection in store for us where God will restore us to perfect bodies in a perfect world. And that fact puts everything else in perspective. When Jesus went to Calvary's cross, he paid the price for the world's sin. He bled for us. He died for us. He gives us new life now and eternal life in the world to come. And having been equipped with those words of Jesus... Knowing his word and his promises, we can face every challenge boldly in grace and in hope. And that is why we have the church. To not only teach us Jesus' words, but to remind us of these words. This morning as we celebrate communion, you'll hear Jesus' words spoken by Pastor Stecker. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. Every Sunday is a reminder for us forgetful people that we have a victorious and risen Lord. So comfort one another with these words. When we see our brothers and sisters in Christ and they're under physical or spiritual assault, they might not remember those words of Jesus. 
So it's our job to remember those words for them, to remind them of those words when they slip from memory to restore their joy. Death looms over us and seems so powerful, and we will seemingly do anything to avoid it. And in our fear and our anger and our grief, we might slip away. We might forget. But you know what? Jesus never forgets us. We might forget his words, but he doesn't. He never forgets us. He never forgets his promises to us. He's faithful to us even when we forget and wander. And that is very good news for each of us. This, my friends, is not only the day of resurrection, it is a season of resurrection. I watched for three months last year as this church was closed on Sunday morning. It looked dead. Anybody driving by would have looked in and not seen a car in the parking lot. And you know what? I was sitting on my couch at home watching myself on a recorded YouTube service. We did what we had to do, but thanks be to God that that time has passed. The church never really died, did it? The heart still beats. God's power and grace will not be stopped by anything, especially the specter of death. It's a powerful enemy, but it's a loser. Death is a loser. And we can't forget Christ's words to us. Even when death is at our doorstep, the Holy Spirit is dwelling in us and Jesus stands by our side. When Jesus rose, he returned to fellowship with the disciples. We're told that after he appeared to them, he ate and drank in front of them. He had fellowship with them. His restoration to life wasn't just that his heart started beating, but that he was living in community with his disciples. And that's the restoration we have here at Grace as well. Our church's heart is beating. Our fellowship is restored. The sun is rising on this congregation, and it is a glorious sight. Because you know what? I'm remembering one other thing Jesus said to his disciples that even the gates of hell would not prevail against his church. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. May the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.